Thank you, Jenny, and good evening, everyone. Um, yes, my journey into this world of neurodiversity started a decade ago um, after my much-wanted daughter was born, um, literally from the first day she was different. She was the only baby who cried all night in hospital. Even the experienced midwives couldn't pacify her. Um, she was the only toddler who went wild if I just walked a different way to the shops. Um, she was the only preschooler who wouldn't do anything she was told. Um, and when I asked my lovely health visitor, why did she flap her hands when she got excited? The health visitor said, oh, some children just do that. And when I said to her very experienced preschool teacher, why was I the only mother invited into the classroom when they started for three weeks? Um, she said, oh, some children just need a bit of extra reassurance. But they all had their suspicions. And finally, after two terms, um, the preschool teacher called me in and said, had I noticed anything unusual about my daughter? Well, I'd been telling everyone she was unusual, and everyone had been telling me I was just a neurotic first-time mother. But um, they had collected a whole dossier of evidence, and they presented this to me. And the word Asperger syndrome was mentioned, and I'd never heard of it before. And I went home, and I Googled it, and it was literally like somebody had given me the key to unlocking my daughter. And it all made sense, and it wasn't my fault. That was just the beginning. So fast forward 10 years, and I'm working for Advance. And I'm not going to tell you lots about them, because we've got to stand outside, and you can come and find out for yourself in the break. And I know you're meant to be having a break now, but I am going to need another 10 minutes or so, so please bear with me if you can. Um, but suffice to say that um, we train parents um, and professionals who deal with um, a broad range of conditions. Um, and our founder, Anne Ross, Anne, will you just stand up and give everyone a wave, please? She's here. She's a very interesting and dynamic lady with a whole heap of experience. And sadly, her son wasn't diagnosed nearly as early as he ought to have been. But fine, he was excluded from three different schools. He ended up in a special behavioral unit. But when he did get a diagnosis and the right support, he went on to get a degree, and he now has a brilliant job with a blue chip company on their graduate training scheme, and is excelling, like many of our children can. So what do we mean by early intervention? Well, often what springs to mind is quite expensive um, sort of add-on therapies, specialist speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, diet or vitamin regimes, even medication. And these have a place and can be really effective for some children. But in fact, an intervention is any kind of activity, a treatment, a therapy, or the provision of a service that's designed to improve the quality of life for a people with a particular condition. Unfortunately, as Tom said, um, there's very little scientific research to support many interventions. And that's why um, organizations like Research Autism are trying to bring together all the available research and provide an objective evaluation of different interventions. At the last count, look at their website, there were 1,117 different interventions on their A to Z. Um, and as you can imagine, parents are often so desperate to help their children and help their families that they were willing to try anything. And while the research, um, what the research does show is that while there's no cure for neurodevelopmental disorders, um, some interventions do appear to help at least some individuals. Now, Tom talked about parenting strategies as one way of, one intervention that has very high success rates. Parents don't cause their children's neurodiversity, but they can certainly do things to help or hinder. And the same is true of education. Education is one of the most effective interventions. Um, and children spend so much time at school that it has a huge impact on their self-esteem and the resulting behavior. Education is particularly important for neurodiverse children because they need to be actively taught everything, not just the academic stuff, but all the social, emotion, emotional, and behavioral stuff as well. So 
An autistic child is not going to learn how to queue for lunch just by watching the other children do it. You know, you're going to need to actively explain to them in a very logical way. You'll probably need to use visual cues or social stories, and then they'll need lots of practice besides supportive peers. A child with ADHD isn't going to learn to put up his hand because there's an imbalance of neurotransmitters in his brain, which means that he can't control his impulsivity. Instead, he'll need to be taught other ways of dealing with it. For example, like writing down the, answer, the, the, the question he wants to ask as soon as he thinks of it. Now, we know that about 70% of children with neurodevelopmental disorders are educated in mainstream schools where they can do really well when there are reasonable adjustments made to support them. And one of the best ways of doing this is to have a menu of, of strategies that the school uses. Um, Class teachers, TA, SENCOs, often have training in this, and they work really well with educational psychologists, the communication disorders team, and others um, to decide which strategies to use for each um, child to get the best out of them. There's a nice example here from Pixmore School in Letchworth. Um, it's just a sample of their menu of strategies. Um, if you can't read it, I've got a paper copy if you're interested in the break. Um, and sometimes relatively small, inexpensive strategies can make all the difference to a child's understanding, their anxiety levels, and their ability to express themselves. So one of my favourites is the bear cave. This is in, an, in a reception class. It's just a table with a tablecloth spread over it, with lots of cushions and teddies and books inside. And if a, if a young child finds themselves themselves angry or frustrated like, a, like an angry bear, then they're allowed to just remove themselves, go into the bear cave for some time out to calm down, and then rejoin the class when they feel ready. So it's a great way of teaching young children to recognize those difficult feelings and to um, deal with them in a way that's acceptable. A neurodiverse child will learn more effectively where teaching strategies focus on the cognitive deficits, and by that I mean their level of understanding, um, rather than just simply punishing the, the bad behaviour. So I'm, you know, I'm still hearing examples almost weekly of children who are being punished, young children, sort of reception year one, who are being punished for putting their hands up in assembly. Um, you can move them to the cloudy side of the board as many times as you like, and you can take away as much golden time as you like, but they're not going to learn to show deference to the head teacher unless you take the time to explain the hierarchy of the school. Um, and, 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 and it has to be in a way that they understand. You know, talking about the kind of um, laws of the jungle can be quite a good way of doing it, with the head teacher being the lion at the top of the tree. Um, and how do you actually prioritise these strategies, make them happen, um, and evaluate whether they're working? Well, that's where individual education plans come in, or IEPs. Um, ideally, they should be written with the help of the parents, because, of course, we know the parents are experts. And, and of course, with input from the child, because they're the ones that need to be working on these targets and understanding them. They should use clear, simple, non-judgmental language, and obviously they should be reviewed regularly. There's a nice example here from Crabtree School in Harpenden. This was a year two boy. His mum and he were both involved in the, in the words for this, which are just really clear. Um, and he decided how success would be measured. He also suggested that the target should be put on a laminated uh, bookmark um, so that he could keep it in his transparent pencil case and then glance at it surreptitiously throughout the day to remind him what he ought to be doing. Um, and I think he had about four IEPs in total following his diagnosis of ADHD. And he made such astonishing progress that he doesn't have IEPs anymore because both the school and his parents don't think they're necessary. So in terms of education as an intervention, these are the things that work in theory. This is good practice. Um, but how does it, is it actually working in practice? Well, HARC, which is the Hertfordshire branch of the National Autistic Society, very conveniently um, did a survey uh, last year, an online survey to find out more about the educational experiences of families with autistic children. 
Now, although this was families with autistic children, do bear in mind that, as Tom said, there's a lot of crossover with other conditions. So about 60% of those will have ADHD, another 30% will have epilepsy, um, about 60 to 70% will have a specific learning difficulty, most will have dyspraxia. So you're actually talking about a lot of neurodiversity within this population, and there were, five, there were 400, just short of 400 respondents in total. Well, based on the anecdotal evidence that I'm hearing from teachers and parents in the workshops and, and courses I, I run, I, I was expecting the results to be sobering. But even I was surprised by, by some of this. Only one in 10 parents feel that educational provision is adequate 70% of high-functioning children are being bullied, and 44% are being, of those are being bullied every day. And almost half of schools are not taking effective action against that, even though we know that schools have to have bullying policies. 38% of children are being excluded on a regular basis and for quite long periods of time. Now, we know that children learn best when they're comfortable and safe because that's the premise of safeguarding, and we all have to have that training. But many neurodiverse children do not feel comfortable and safe at school. They find the environment confusing at best and totally overwhelming at worst. They feel like square pegs in round holes, or as Claire Sainsbury, the granddaughter of J.S. Sainsbury, put it, um, they feel like Martians in the playground kind of beamed down from another planet and trying to make sense of this strange land. Tony Atwood, the leading expert on Asperger's syndrome, says that um, when, a child, when, a, when a child with Asperger's is anxious, their IQ drops on average by 30 points. So that's the difference between being normal with an IQ of 100 and being gif really gifted with 130, or being normal with an IQ of 100 and having an IQ of 70, which would be considered to be quite severely learning disabled. Um, and that's all because of anxiety. So you know, these children, many of whom have real gifts and talents, um, instead of using those gifts for the benefit of society, instead they end up being a burden to society because we're not finding an outlet for them to express these things. So what needs to change? Well. Early identification, as we've heard, whether that is from a screening tool, such as Simon's talked about, um, or whether it's just about people having the guts to put their money where their mouth is early on. Um, you know, these things are quite easy to spot if you're, if, if, if once you've got some life experiences. I'm sure all you teachers in the room have got some kids in your class that you think, hmm something not quite right there, but what, at what point do I mention it? What evidence do I need? Um, when, I, when, when Rosie finally got a diagnosis, um, both the health visitor and the preschool teacher said to me, yeah, no, we knew from the beginning. Well, if you knew from the beginning, why didn't you tell me? It would have made my life so much easier. <coughs> Better understanding of strengths and challenges. Um, obviously, as Tom said, um, speaking to parents can be a really good way of getting to know the child better. And, um, and it is so important that you do this because, on average, you can expect about five or six neurodiverse children in a class of 30. And, um, and we all know how frustrating they can be. They've got these very spiky profiles and, 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 and very distinctive learning styles. But if we can find a way um, to help them demonstrate their talents, then often that's a great spur to, to their confidence and it motivates them to achieve in areas that they find more challenging as well. Adequate support and resource as well. Many is the time, sadly, that I've had a teacher in tears on the phone to me because they are absolutely exasperated by a difficult child. They want to help him or her and they just don't know what to do next. Um, it often seems like you're spending all your time on the one or two tricky ones to the detriment of the others in the class. Now, I feel really strongly that teaching staff need to be honest with their leadership about the amount of support needed and should expect to be adequately resourced. Asking for help is not an admittance of, of defeat. It proves that you want the best for your class. 
And to those of you who, here who make decisions about schools funding, I urge you to listen to staff at grassroots level and make appropriate provision for, for, for education interventions. I was really lucky that through Rosie's fabulous preschool, she had one-to-one -one support for a year before she started primary. And that in, that, in those nine months from September to July, she progressed in social and emotional terms by two and a half years with a very experienced one-to-one -one teacher. And it meant when she started in reception, she was more or less up to the level of her peers and, and she was able to make friends and, and as a result she has good self-esteem and she's been relatively socially accepted by her peers. Um, compare this to the other little girl in her class who has autism, whose preschool didn't acknowledge issues, who didn't have any support, who started reception significantly behind her peers and who is still being ostracised and ha it now has had a massive effect on her self-esteem and her ability to try things. And, you know, I, she's now getting a lot of support in terms of a challenging behaviour team and uh, art therapy and all sorts of other things. But it's too little too late. If we'd have put it in place in the, early enough, we wouldn't be faced with these challenges now. You know, never was the old adage, a stitch in time saves nine, more true than in this situation. But for me, the thing that makes the biggest difference is empathy. And I'm going to tell you a story now. How much time do we have? Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, I was involved where, with a, a school where a little girl was becoming very disruptive because she didn't want to go into her Spanish class. She was year one. And um, every Wednesday when Spanish was timetabled, she wouldn't go to school. And they'd finally get her into school. And she'd become increasingly anxious as the lesson drew near. And this culminated one day in her biting the TA, who was trying to coax her into the class. And um, her teacher called me and said, what, sh what can I do? How can I deal with this unruly child? They couldn't let her have her own way, of course, because that would send a message to the other children that if you don't like something, you can just worm your way out of it. Um, and they didn't have the manpower to facilitate another lesson. I just said to them, have you asked her what the problem is? Have you asked her why she doesn't like Spanish? I said, well, it must just be because she finds it confusing and difficult. And I said, well, ask her. She may not be able to tell you, but it's worth saying to her, you know, what are you thinking when you go into that Spanish class? So they did. And she said, I'm not thinking anything because the smell of that carpet is so bad that I can't think at all. And it transpired that this new carpet had a very chemically smell which was completely overwhelming to this child. The teacher's first response was, well, I'm afraid there's nothing we can do about that. This is the only room that we have for Spanish. And again, I said, ask her what she thinks we can do to solve the problem. She said, well, could I sit on a chair at the side? Because if I was a few feet higher, a little bit higher than the carpet, then the smell wouldn't be so overpowering. So that's what they did. And then she was fine in Spanish. <sighs> you know. So what's special about an empathic teacher? Well, let's look at each of these in turn. An empathic teacher is able to walk in the shoes of neurodiverse children, metaphorically speaking, to understand what life is like from their point of view. These children don't behave in a challenging way for no good reason. There's always an unmet need, and if you can address that need, then the behavior will diminish. But of course, the, dif the, the danger that many teachers and parents fall into is that as the behavior becomes more challenging, then you become more authoritarian. Um, and that just increases the child's feeling of being out of control <laughs> and leads to a battle of wills that's in, in nobody's interests. Whilst a menu of teaching strategies is helpful as a starting point, there's no textbook way of dealing with these children because although they have similar traits, they all have unique personalities and temperaments. And the bear cave may work for one child, but it may not work for another. What children need is open-minded teachers who are willing to see things from their point of view, to collaborate with their parents, and to work out what's best for each individual and adopt a flexible approach. Once you really get inside the head of a neurodiverse child, you can start to appreciate their strengths and hopefully get to the point where you actually like them or at least admire their abilities. And I have to admit, I didn't always like my daughter. 
in spite of our biological bond and the fact it took me seven years to conceive her, um, she was so difficult and I took her behaviour so personally and I struggled to connect with her. It's hard when you have a child who won't look at you while you're breastfeeding, who thinks that you know, bedtime kisses are a violation. Um, but now I understand her better. I understand that eye contact is physically painful. Um, I don't take it personally anymore, and I've started to appreciate her very remarkable gifts. An empathic teacher knows the child's learning profile and motivators, and they've done this really well at Rosie School. Over the six years she's been there now, they've worked out what makes her tick, and they've passed that information up year on year, so we're not starting from scratch again each September. It's got to the stage now where really the only intervention she has is that the TA notices when her face goes blank and her eyes go wide, and that's the look of anxiety. And he just creeps up behind her, not too creepy actually, but you know, he sort of comes close and he just said, would you like me to repeat that? Or he'll just write it down in, on her jotter so that she's, that maybe the instruction she hasn't understood or that she's misheard is then crystal clear. She likes that. She doesn't want to be singled out from her peers. Um, and it's those kind of subtle interventions um, that nip the problems in the bud that can be so effective. An empathic teacher creates an appropriate learning environment because you're seeing things from the child's point of view. You know, often this is about having a quiet, well-structured classroom with minimal shouting because that increases sensory overload. There's lots of other things as well, but it's, again, it's about creating a, a situation where the child's ability to complete work to a good standard um, can be achieved. Now, this last one is interesting because two of Rosie's primary school years really stand out as being over and above brilliant compared to... And they, they, they've all been OK. Um, she adored the staff in these years. Her anxiety levels were non-existent, um, and her progress in terms of social, emotional, academic stuff just soared. The main reason? Because one teacher had a brother with autism, and the TA she's got currently has a son with Asperger's. Um, they just both know instinctively how to get the best out of her. The, the empathy is easy, because they have personal experience of it. Um, very often, when things work well, it's down to individuals, and it's down to individuals who've either got that personal experience or who are just naturally very empathic, um, very nurturing. And of course, it's much easier to be empathic if you have a personal experience or if it comes naturally to you. Um, but it's worth remembering that most teachers actually go into teaching with that overwhelming desire to, to support and care for and relate to their pupils. Um, and it's a shame that as classrooms become larger and more diverse, it I know it becomes harder for teachers to take into account the feelings of individuals and, and, to, and to model that personal caring approach all the time. But we must aim for this because, as lovely Bridget Cooper um, puts in her study of student teachers at Leeds Metropolitan University, um, Empathy is the basis of caring relationships and allows us to connect and understand those who may be different from ourselves. Showing empathy benefits all children, not just, th not just those with diagnostic labels. And of course, neurodiverse children are often accused of, being, of lacking empathy themselves, aren't they? The autistic ones seem to find it just more difficult to, to recognise and express emotions in themselves and others. And the ADHD ones are just too distracted to even notice um, emotions. Um, what better way to teach empathy to them than by being a good role model yourselves? In fact, this is now being explored at this university. Um, they're starting to, they're just embarking on a study um, to investigate the impact of an empathic approach to, ne to neurodiverse children in mainstream schools, primary schools. Um, and so if you are in, if you know anybody who might be interested in funding this study, <laughs> or if you are a school who might be interested in having your TAs take part in some of this empathy training, um, then please do contact Helen Payne, the Professor of Psychotherapy, because I know she'd be very interested to hear from you. Okay.